a call for help. Montgomery County 911. There's blood everywhere. And they're dead. I don't know what, what happened. After a savage attack. There is literally blood everywhere in this crime scene. She is nearly decapitated. But who's responsible? This was a whodunit from the very beginning. And why? Because of the overkill, maybe there's some sort of vengeance here. We had a killer living among us. Montgomery County 911. Oh, my God. We were on our way back here for Mother's Day. And Fire, she said she just got home and that both her parents were on the floor and there was a lot of blood and she thinks they're both dead. It's Sunday morning, Mother's Day, and just minutes before this panicked 911 call, Katie and Andy Villardo are waiting at a picnic area for their parents, Dick and Jody, to celebrate the holiday. But their folks are a no-show. The children are waiting for their parents at a, at a uh, restaurant for, for a prearranged Mother's Day, and uh, they can't raise them on the phone, have not heard from them since the night before. Concerned, the kids rush to their parents' home in the upscale neighborhood of Rockville, Maryland. Once inside... There's a pretty horrific discovery. There is literally blood everywhere in this crime scene, uh, on do doors, walls, floors, ceilings. Police are on scene within minutes of the 911 call. They follow the blood trail to the backyard. Their mother is on the floor uh, with multiple catastrophic injuries, most notably uh, to her neck. Uh, she, uh, she is nearly decapitated. And just outside the back patio door, another grim discovery. The father, just a few feet away from his wife, he had made his way out the back sliding glass door, collapsed on a back patio, and he has multiple injuries, more than 40 stabbing injuries. And they've obviously been deceased for some period of time. Dick and Jody Villardo's last contact with their kids was a phone call around 9 p.m. the night before. The couple spent the evening with friends at a nearby casino and returned home sometime after 11 p.m. But what horrific events occurred from Saturday night to Sunday morning? This was a whodunit from the very beginning. If you look at the crime scene, it almost immediately tells you someone attacked this man as he lay in bed and then uh, basically savagely also at attacked his, his wife. And who would want to kill Dick and Jody Villardo? The happily married couple of 40 years built a successful life in the community of Rockville, and they were actively involved in local charities. He was a great guy who obviously had financially been very, very successful in his life, as his wife had. Uh, he had raised two great kids. He had a beautiful home. This was a neighborhood where double homicides don't occur. Police search the home. They immediately discover the point of entry, a den window, a screen is cut, and lock jimmied. Then, bloody footprints everywhere. It's a path of destruction with one notable pattern. One of the things we noted right away, again, an oddity is that the attacker, we believe the attacker did this without shoes on. He had just, he had taken his shoes off. Barefooted? Not barefooted, but in socks. You could see in the impressions of the feet that go through the house that were now soaked in blood, you could see that a sock pattern, like a crew sock pattern. Upstairs in the bedroom, investigators photograph blood-stained money and empty jewelry boxes. And what was taken from their home? Cash, jewelry, uh, Rolex watches. A clear picture of the attack from start to finish emerges. He was laying in the bed when the attack occurred. The attacker left him for dead, and the wife, uh, who was on the other side of the bed, furthest away from the initial attack, ran out of the bedroom and into the kitchen area. Where police believe Jody Villardo makes a mad dash for the landline phone, desperate to dial 911. On a house phone. On the house phone. Yeah, because we found that and it was missing a piece. It, it looked like it had been either slammed or dropped, and then she was the focus of the attack. And the weapon of choice? A serious, serious uh, knife. That nearly decapitates Jody. Then a very odd piece of evidence jumps out to detectives. There's a bloody glove handprint on the fridge. Did the killer open it? Detectives wonder if the suspect is familiar with the house. Then this terrifying possibility. That we had a killer living among us. The Villardo's closest neighbors are Eve Dempshire, who lives just across the street, and the Tomaszewski family, who lives right next door. Both families have known the Villardo's for decades. Eve Dempshire is an elderly woman who is home at the time of the attacks, and the Tomaszewski family is currently on a cruise in Alaska. And the other neighbors living around the Villardos? 
Well, they don't actually strike the cops as prime suspects. The neighbors were fantastic. They wanted to help with whatever they could. In fact, one of the nicest things that came out of it, you know, after working a week solid on the case is one of the neighbors actually baked this huge tray of cookies. Even the Tomaszewski's youngest son, Scott, gets word about the murders while on vacation with his family and posts this heartfelt message on Facebook. They were such nice people. I can't imagine who would do this. Scary to hear about this having possibly happened as we were leaving for our trip. Neighbors were very worried. To everyone's knowledge in this neighborhood, this could be just someone that burglarized this house, targeted these people, and did this horrific act and could show up in their houses. Police have their work cut out for them. For multiple days in this case, there really was no solid lead. This was a wide open case. This was a red ball. No one really had an idea as to who was responsible for it. The Villardos had been at the nearby casino the night they died. Police investigate if there was a connection, and they have good reason to believe there might have been one. We were dealing with a rash of robberies of people that had gone to casinos uh, and then been followed from the casino and robbed once they got their, to their residences. Uh, we had uh, initial information that the Villardos had testified in a federal case. Uh, and so that's always in, in our minds that, okay, maybe they're, because of the overkill, maybe there's some sort of vengeance here. And another possible lead pointed to local landscapers. We had information that there were some woodchuckers in the neighborhood, people that were going around asking neighbors, hey, can I cut some trees down on your property? They're kind of a transient group that just move around the neighborhood. Both leads are eventually dead ends. Then cops finally get the break they've been waiting for from one of their own. A retired police officer who called in and said, hey, by the way, let me tell you about something that happened years ago. Beloved Maryland couple Dick and Jody Villardo are murdered in their upscale neighborhood. And now cops get a big break in the case, a tip from one of their own, telling them to take a look at the boy next door, Brian Tomaszewski. And said, hey, you might want to look at this. When you got the phone call from the retired sergeant, what did you think initially? We thought it was interesting. We thought there was potential. Ends up when Brian was a juvenile, he burglarized the Villardo's home, then took one of their cars on a joyride. Then all of a sudden, you have this golden suspect that's staring you in the face. He lives right next door. He knows the house. He is a number one suspect. But how could Brian kill Dick and Jody? The Tomaszewskis are all supposed to be on vacation. Brian did not go on the trip to Alaska. It was just Scott his mother and father, and his older sister. Police interview Brian. He didn't provide us anything really substantial. Police no longer believe Brian is involved. So since the Villardos were also burglarized after being killed, cops turn their focus to local pawn shops hoping for a hit. And boy, do they get one. All of a sudden, uh, Scott showed up as pawning something. That Scott is Scott Tamaszewski. Yes, Brian's little brother. He pawns a ring. Belonging to? Belonging to his neighbor. But not the Villardos. His other neighbor, Eve Demsher, who lives directly across the street. The class ring had been reported stolen just a month before the Villardo break-in. It fits now. It's starting to fit. We're starting to fit the crime to the person, if you will. In fact, it's all captured on pawn shop surveillance cameras. The incriminating frame-by-frame -frame evidence shows Scott Tomaszewski pawning the stolen ring. All of a sudden, we now have probable cause for a burglary arrest. But burglary is a far cry from murder. Detectives know they'll need direct evidence tying Scott to the murders. And they're hoping Scott packs something extra in his suitcase. Detectives know if Scott committed the murders, it happened sometime between 1.30 a.m. and the time he left for the cruise at 3 a.m. We already knew that there was a very, very small window he had if it was Scott to commit this crime, and that he could very well have taken all of the evidence. Where's Scott? He was at sea. We knew he was coming into port in Juneau. That became the port of call that we were interested in acting on. And investigators want to make sure that Scott isn't tipped off, giving him time to destroy evidence. You could walk to the edge of the ship and toss off a Rolex watch, toss off cash, toss off bloody clothes. If we tipped our hand too soon, it, it was just another thing that could go wrong that would allow, if there was evidence on that cruise ship, that could allow that evidence to escape us. 
Plus, investigators know Scott is in contact with his brother back home, evidenced by this text message from Scott while on the cruise ship. I'm like 2,000 miles away, and it's still scary. There's been a bunch of robberies in the area, and now a double murder, and all cops said before was it's landscapers or kids. Expletive lazy. How are these expletive employed? What did you do? What we decided to do was a simultaneous search warrant in Juneau as the ship was arriving and on the Tomaszewski's house here. To ensure they don't lose any evidence, the search warrants have to be served at the exact same moment. We sent them out, uh, we got them on the first flight we could on Friday so we could make sure they got into Juneau Friday night because they had to liaison with the Coast Guard because as the ship's coming in, the other thing, we couldn't let him get off the ship. And if they had pulled into dock, then we weren't there to get him in his room. He could have easily slinked out and again, get that alert, get whatever it is. Evidence goes with him and then goes in a trash can in Juneau. We'd never find it. So the Coast Guard actually held the ship up for us. Yes, the Coast Guard holds the ship at sea. When these law enforcement partners get together, boundaries go away especially when you tell them we're working this double homicide. Well, they were in international waters when we actually figured out where he was. He was not in U.S. territory. He was on a boat in international waters. So the ship is being held up mm -hmm. at sea. Yes. He can't get off. Right. When that ship finally docks, what happens in Alaska? Uh, our folks, along with the local authorities, FBI, they liaison with the ship's crew. Even the ship wasn't quite aware of what was going on because, again, we couldn't risk. You had to keep it close to the vest. Yeah. The FBI, the Coast Guard, cops from Juneau, and detectives from Montgomery County stormed the ship in Juneau and handcuffed Scott. What was his reaction? Just kind of nonplussed. No reaction? No. Not, not, what, not what you would expect. Detectives hit the evidence lottery once inside Scott's cabin. In his wallet, they discover blood-soaked cash, and in the closet under his clothes, a knife. And back at the Tomaszewski home, cops find a little pile of incriminating evidence. Go to the washing machine, and there's these musty, dark clothes in them. It looks like they have some sort of stain on them. The washing machine turns up plenty of dirt on Scott, including a ski mask and gloves. Investigators arrest Scott on a burglary charge, but they have a strong feeling they'll be adding charges of double homicide. Police remove Scott from the ship in handcuffs, and his folks? They got off the ship and went on a tour. Mom and dad got off the ship and went on a tour. Yes. While Scott's parents continue their vacation, their son meets with detectives back at the Montgomery County Police Department. Scott agrees to talk with investigators without an attorney. His interview is recorded. When was the last time you went to their house? 15 years ago. That long? Yeah. Scott explains to detectives that he grew up with the Villardo children, Andy and Katie. But since college, the families have drifted apart. You didn't go in there to kill him, did you? No, 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 no. So what happened? Did you get startled? Like, what happened? It all just happened so fast. So I don't even know why or how it happened. Do you think he knew who you were? I don't know. I, I, I wanted to leave and I stabbed him. What did you stab him with? The knife. After murdering Dick, Scott tells cops he started stabbing Jody. Did you stab her? I fell on top of her with a knife. And that's when I just took off, ran home. Then he tells detectives he ditched the knife. What happened to the knife? Pretty sure I threw it away. Like in your house? In the uh, trash can inside your house? Yeah. As for an actual motive, the murders appear to be about as senseless and cold as Scott's final act in the home just moments after the murders. Stop and drink a ginger ale, then go back to his house. Murder is a thirsty business for Scott, according to detectives who found blood transfer on the fridge door and a can of ginger ale. And when they asked Scott about it, he said, quote, I may have grabbed a ginger ale out of there because my throat was really dry. But while the evidence mounts, investigators are missing a huge piece of the puzzle, a second, larger knife they believe was used in the attack, one they believe they've seen before in this text message from Scott to his ex-girlfriend just days before the murder. It's a photo of a machete and this message. You don't have a hockey mask I can borrow, do you? I need to get some work done.
Then cops get a tip about a secret hiding place. And we learn that there was a backpack secreted back in this, it was back in this closet behind this, behind this area. The boy next door, Scott Tomaszewski, has been arrested for the murders of his longtime neighbors, Dick and Jody Villardo. And police are on the hunt for the murder weapon he used to slaughter them. And we learned that there was a backpack secreted back in this, it was back in this closet behind this, behind this area. You go back and look for that bag. It's not there. Now, cops know Scott had some help. Mom took the bag uh, and threw it out. What was in that bag? Uh, as near as we can tell, it was uh, Dick Villardo's watches. Uh, we believe the actual murder weapon uh, was in that bag. Scott's mother faces charges of accessory after the fact, but she's offered a plea bargain. Instead, Mrs. Tomaszewski won't be charged if she agrees to testify against her own son. The evidence that we had, because everything fell in line, was so overwhelming against Scott. She didn't have a choice. Scott is charged with two counts of first-degree murder, two counts of armed robbery, and one count of first-degree burglary. Scott pleads guilty. There won't be a trial, and his mother will not have to testify. Come on up here with me. But we still wanted to hear Mrs. Tomaszewski's side of the story. Hey, Jeanette. So we sent our Michelle Sagona out to talk to her. I'm from Crime Watch Dale. <laughs> I'm sorry, if this is for the newspaper, no, I'm not interested. It's, um, we're actually a television show. And I'm just wondering, did you help your, did, did you help your son hide evidence? What? Is there anything about your son you'd want people to know? No, I don't. Nothing at Nothing. all? No. Anything about his upbringing no. No. or who he is no. or you anything so you no. want people to know about you? So that was Scott's mom, and she doesn't really have anything to say. So maybe we'll see her at the sentencing. The day has finally arrived, and we are at the courthouse in Montgomery County, Maryland, awaiting sentencing. Scott Tomaszewski receives two consecutive life sentences. Standing alongside prosecutors, the Villardo children are there with reaction to the verdict. Okay. Can you just share with us and for the cameras just a, a few moments about about them, who they were? You, you know what? If Katie's willing to do this, I'm going to ask Katie. I'm going to ask Katie to answer that question. The thought that someone could actively take the lives of two people and not recognize that the amount of love that existed there and the love that they would have given to him if he was so willing to accept it is just a really sad situation to me. How does something like this impact you on a personal level? For me, just the absolute senselessness of it all. It just, it just, it, it just stays, just a little piece of it just stays there. It's not, it's not so much the images. They don't stay with me in particular, but the absolute senseless loss of life. Prosecutors say there is little doubt that love defined this couple up until the very end. Dick Villardo, the last thing he did on earth was he was able to gather himself and he went from his bedroom as he was dying to try to save his wife. 